Uh, cool. We're actually from Silicon Alley, uh, which is uh, the New York version of, of that. Um, but cool. So thank you everyone for being here. Um, we might uh, may appear a bit tired because it was kind of a long journey from, from New York all the way down here. Uh, but we're very glad to be here. And so first for introductions. Uh, so my name is Ricardo. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Roger. Uh, that's Blix, he'll say a few words for him, but uh, as for me, I'm originally Portuguese. I've uh, lived and worked in a bunch of countries around the world and um, uh, worked for Spotify uh, for about five years in Stockholm, then in the end went to the US to, uh, to launch the company there. Um, and that's about it. Do you want to say a few words? So I'm Blix, actually Andreas Blix, but everybody calls me Blix. Um, I am Swedish. I, uh, I started working with software engineering when I was 15. Um, so, and then worked at a lot of different places, but eventually ended up at Spotify for over five years, uh, where I met Ricardo. Uh, we moved over to New York together and started up the engineering office, as Ricardo said. And um, yeah, eventually we started a company together. Uh, so yeah, so then I'm going to tell a little bit about why we left Spotify and kind of what we're working on. Uh, so this is Roger, and um, Roger is actually tricky to explain, but it's essentially we're trying to build the voice interface uh, for everything. Uh, and the, the sort of the background to that is there's been in, in sort of recent years a lot of uh, developments in, in voice recognition and, and voice technology. Uh, there's of course a lot of countries in the world where uh, where voice is sort of taking over from text, uh, namely in, in China with WeChat, um, uh, where actually there's more people sharing voice notes than, the, than they are sharing text, but also in South America. And now the interesting thing though is that that hasn't happened in the US or Europe. Uh, however, there has been a lot of voice technology happening in those places, such as uh, Amazon uh, Alexa or the Echo. I don't know who here knows what the Echo is. Yep, not a lot, not a lot of people. But essentially, the, um, the Amazon Echo is a device that you have at home. It's always connected, uh, and so it's it's magical in the sense that it's it's kind of a new way of interacting with the computer because you don't go there and you tap a button. You just say. Alexa, what's the weather like? And and she just speaks out. And and there's a lot of it has a lot of very good microphones in it. So you can you know you can essentially use it from anywhere in your in your apartment. It will, it, a lot of people use it for controlling their smart home appliances. You know home automation, lock the doors and lock the doors. Uh, Blix uses it to control the the lights when he when he comes home. Um, and and so anyway. There's been a lot of these developments. There's a, a few other companies doing interesting things there. Google is coming out with Google Home. Uh, there's another company by the founders of Siri uh, called Viv, which is also doing, they're trying to do the, kind of like Skynet, you know, from the Terminator movies, the idea of this computer who's ev uh, where, that is everywhere. And then their idea uh, of it is that in, in, a, in a not so distant future, every object around you could essentially be connected. And as long as it has a microphone, it can be a computing device. So nowadays we carry phones in our pockets and we think it's awesome. You know, we take them out and we, you know, we're essentially connected. And they want to take it one level further where essentially if I'm out in the street and I just say, I'd like an Uber, essentially something around me, it might be this, this cup that in the meantime has a, a small microphone and uh, it recognizes that I'm Ricardo, this is your account and, you know, and your Uber shows up. So that's kind of what they're trying to do, uh, which is both awesome and, and scary. Um, and, and so in Roger, what we're trying to do is we're, we're essentially doing very similar things in that space where what we're building is a voice interface, like I said. So it allows you both to talk to people and groups like it, it is here. It actually also connects to Alexa, as you see there, as well as uh, integrations with uh, some other platforms. And, um, and that's kind of what we're, we're going for, essentially enabling you to, to interact with technology by not by having to type or, or touch. It will just understand you and, um, and, uh, and allow you to do things. More interestingly, we're doing something that n no one has been doing, which is this concept of having these smart agents in, uh, in groups. So essentially, um, in, for instance, in my case, uh, I live with my wife, and then we have a few of these uh, agents as part of our conversation, and so we can, we can all kind of share it. Uh, and that's kind of what we're trying to do. Um, we're also backed by social capital. 
which is one of the top uh, VCs in the world. They're actually the second uh, fastest VC to reach uh, one uh, billion uh, in management. And uh, it's founded by uh, this guy, Chamat Palia Pattaya. Uh, does anyone know who he is? Yep, not a lot. <laughs> well, no one actually. Uh, so Chamat was the was the VP of growth at Facebook. Uh, so he joined Facebook when there was um, 30. Uh, they had actually already 30 million users, uh, and his job was to get it to 1 billion, um, and he was fairly successful at that, as you all know. And um, and then he, he got tired of social in his own uh, in his own words, and decided to to start social capital. Funny enough, with the social name. Um, but yeah. And so what we're here to tell you about today is actually how we got there. Um, and I know that Magic this year is very focused on the several steps to building a company. As we said uh, before, um, we, we used to be part of Spotify, so we kind of know a lot about the latest stages of, of, uh, of growth and, and how to build a company. But actually building Roger was completely uh, new to us because you have to go exactly from, you know, from from square one, you know, from actually not having anything, just having a, a couple of ideas uh, and which you're not really sure if they're worth pursuing or not. And then how do you get that into a point where you actually have funding and you start building a team and so on and so forth. Um, and so the way we're going to do it is I'm going to spend some time giving you a little bit of context and sort of storytelling telling about what, uh, what was the journey like. Uh, hopefully make it helpful for you guys and then when you get to the end of it um, I would like to open up the floor to to more of a sort of interactive format where you guys can ask us questions you can ask us uh, how we actually uh, you know pitch things and uh, and you know what's uh, how to build you know your first investor deck that kind of stuff uh, does that sound good cool tell me if I get too long-winded some people have told me that in the past um, so anyway so this story goes back to um, to March 29, um, 2011. You're, you don't have to read this, nor, nor do I want to. But the reason why I always like to put this email up was that this was, uh, I usually say this was the most special day of my life because this, uh, this was the day I met my now wife and uh, this guy uh, on the same day, actually. And um, not the same person, by the way. Uh, <laughs> it's worth mentioning. So... <laughs> She's all, but she is Swedish though, funny enough, both of them. Uh, anyway, so the other thing that happened that day is that we got this email. And um, so you guys understand, I, was, I, was, uh, I joined Spotify back in 2010. Uh, Blix slightly before me and, um, and the office was fairly small. And funny enough, I, yeah, a week before this actually, I was in Malaysia actually, I was in, in Kuala Lumpur because uh, I remember that I was in Thailand when I said, when I emailed this guy, this was the CTO, he is still the CTO of, of Spotify, and I said, hey, I would like to go to the US to, to help build a company there. And then on this day, uh, this, uh, essentially he, he sent us an email saying, hey, we picked the people that are going to go there to do this and it's going to be uh, Ricardo or Andreas Blix, Eric and uh, Ricardo Santos. And, um, 30 minutes after I got this email, I uh, went out on the date with my now wife. And I was so stoked and I was so excited that the first thing I told her was like, hey, nice to meet you. By the way, I'm moving to New York. And, uh, and so, uh, and, uh, and, you know, life happened and whatever. And in the end, we, we did end up going to, to New York. And, um, and oh yeah, and uh, actually, uh, after dinner, actually, I came back to the Spotify office um, with with Ilan and and the one guy who, uh, and we we had sushi I think for dinner, and then I went to back to the office and there was one guy at the office working late and this was about like midnight and it was this guy. Um, and now the plot twist is that I actually gave him like some sushi leftovers and he threw them away, which I only found out years later. So still sort of, I'm still sort of like coping with it, but uh, but anyway. Eventually, we did move to New York, and uh, there was a lot of a lot of interesting projects we, uh, related with that. I'll, I'll guide you to a few. Um, there's actually some of uh, my fellow ex spotifiers here, uh, like Gary, who will speak to you in the afternoon. And um, so he, we we all remember this office, right? This was the first uh, Spotify office, and it was actually not even our office. It was the office of um, Palm Pictures, right? Which was uh, a film production company which we asked kindly can we please uh, have you know a little a few desks in the in the back and this was actually in the Google building so we were kind of infiltrated there um, in the, in the back and they they tried hard to kick us out and eventually they they, they succeeded but we got even a nicer place and 
But anyway, we did a lot of cool stuff, and and actually one of the first projects that I wasn't so involved in, but uh, Blix was was uh, uh, was the well not not this dinner, but uh, what came out of this dinner. So uh, Spotify and and uh, Facebook. Uh, I think around late 2010 started working on this thing which eventually became known as the open graph and uh, in a lot of other companies of course came on it but it was originally a Spotify project and there was a number of us essentially camped out in the in the in the Facebook office uh, until they also kicked us out and forced us to get <laughs> to get an office so there's a pattern here uh, but anyway so there was a lot of like cool stuff happening and and this was the first thing Blix was doing I was actually in New York uh, uh, helping to build the ad team uh, and um, and Blix was uh, was having sushi with Mark Zuckerberg right and um, to give you a little bit of idea um, I don't know actually everyone on the picture but that's Eric from Spotify, that's Martin, the co-founder of Spotify, uh, Michelle, Priscilla Shen, uh, that's Daniel Ack, uh, that's Yuri Milner, uh, that's Andreas Matson from Spotify, and Zach, of course, and probably a few others that, that I don't remember. Uh, but anyway, we did, we did a lot of cool stuff, right? And this was, of course, a, a fun experience, uh, but probably the most interesting thing is that I started working a lot on, on projects with... Um, with this guy and I actually want to put some emphasis on on this part because this is probably the reason why we have a company today was that we started going to a lot of hackathons and uh, our intent was really to hire people in reality so we would go to hackathons and we would build stuff uh, you know in our own time on on the weekends you know to um, to essentially get to know other engineers in in uh, in, in in the US this particular one is in um, is in Boston um, and I'll tell you what we build here, and um, but also like this, this sort of two pictures because even here there was already a pattern of of uh, Blix working hard and me taking pictures. Um, but this was uh, this was essentially uh, this was the day after because uh, on this particular weekend we built something which we called Spartify, and it was a uh, Spotify party mode, um, which is still to date a very successful product actually, despite us not maintaining it for like four years. And um, and this was just before demo, and you can see we're tired, but we somehow pulled it through. And, uh, and the reality is that this was kind of this was really fun because we spent about ten hours building this. Ironically, we were in a party because um, they kicked us out of the venue, and so we had to go work in a in a essentially in a club, and we were building a, a party mode for Spotify. So essentially. Kind of ironical, right? Because we were in a social context, being completely antisocial, like these two nerds in the corner, like coding. But uh, the reality is that it turned out okay, and then eventually a bunch of press picked up on it, right? And and they um, and it was it was more than even the press picking up on it. It was awesome that the this was Sunday, I think, and um, and the day the Monday, the day after, we got this email, and uh, Oscar was someone in our ad sales uh, team who dealt with um, with Bacardi, and essentially Bacardi wanted to buy Spotify. And um, I cannot talk about values and whatnot, but for us it was really awesome because we essentially built something in, like I said, 10 hours, and we, you know, it felt great because you built something with value, and uh, and there were people that wanted to buy it. Uh, but yeah, but we didn't sell. And the reason why we didn't sell was because, you know, we were, frankly, because we felt, I guess, too cool for it. We had just arrived in the U.S., you know, we were building, you know, Spotify, it was so awesome, and frankly, we didn't, we didn't really care. In hindsight, we probably should have sold, but <laughs> hey, but it, it didn't turn out bad for us either. So, uh, so instead, what did we do? So we continued doing the, doing the um, growing Spotify. Eventually, the U.S. was done, so we moved on to to more new and exciting things. Uh, this is our uh, our first Hong Kong office. Um, you know, because of course we started uh, launching in, in in Asia, which led into a lot of learnings. You know, like going to places like this is in the Philippines, buying uh, buying phones and trying to understand how people use music. Uh, this is Brazil uh, in a favela, actually doing you know sort of breakout groups and trying to understand a little bit better how um, how, uh, how you know how Spotify could grow. And uh, again. Very successful at it, as as you guys know. Um, I think nowadays uh, official numbers is what 100 million users, 40 million paid. Uh, you know, uh, crushing this uh, this other company uh, who's into fruits and vegetables out in the valley. Um, but uh, but anyway, until one day in late 2014, uh, this happened, right? And uh, yeah, 
So essentially, I was going to the. Um, I was I was one day in New York, go, heading to the subway, and I did this. I bumped into a pole while texting, and um, it's actually an actual uh, ac actual story. And that's when I turned to this guy and I said, "Hey, why don't we get together this weekend and we we just build a small prototype of uh, an app that essentially has one button where I tap it and I'm talking to to you." And in this case, I was actually talking when I bumped into the pole. I was talking to a friend in in Sweden, which was far away and it was hard to get on a phone call. I was going to a subway. There's no connection, uh, and so we started building it. And so we brought, and I actually told him that I want it to be the model of Spartify, right? We build it for 10 hours or, or, or over a weekend, then we kind of never look at it again. Um, so that's what we did, right? Uh, this is, well, uh, I guess a bit not too shabby, but uh, it's, uh, this is where I live in New York, uh, and uh, that's, that's us coding, right? That was, that was Roger. And um, that's what we built. This was the first version of Roger. And uh, and the thing, the interesting thing about Roger is that we immediately failed at our premise of of essentially you building it for ten hours and never touching it again. Because essentially we built it and uh, we we started using it immediately. And uh, we I remember we went for dinner that night and we had oh wouldn't it be great if it did this and it, if it did that and we had the kind of freedom to do it because again it wasn't our day to day job. It was just like a hobby we were doing on the side. Um, and so eventually this question popped up, right? You know, why don't you build it for real? Um, and uh, and in, this was actually a conversation I had with the, with, the, with the VC early on, which said, hey, you guys can, can build things, right? You, in our case, I, I, I no longer so much, but I used to be a developer. Blix is so, uh, very much a developer, so we didn't really have that, that much excuses. So often um, founders, you know, complain about not getting money and, uh, and you know, you always kind of try to, I guess, find reasons why things aren't happening. And, uh, you know, oh, if only I had this, if only I had that. And, uh, and the reality is that in this case, actually, this guy um, gave us a push, you know, said, why don't you just do it? You know, what's kind of preventing you? And, and that's what we did. So this was our last day at Spotify, actually. This was a Christmas party, I think, and, um, in uh, 2014. And it was our last day. And then we were off, right? And then uh, trying to build something for real. And uh, we didn't have money. Right, like I said, we didn't. We didn't uh, at this point. We didn't need money. We just needed to build something, and uh, you know, uh, on the sort of user-facing side, you know, our friends were starting to pick up on it. We, you know, we had to start getting a, a borrowing a lot of devices to actually do testing. Uh, doing, uh, sorry, calendar reminders. Let me just close Chrome. Is it back? Yeah. And so, in our principles, were was this right? We wanted to build something that would be human, spontaneous, and magical. So we didn't want to to build another messaging app, you know, that we in which you would create stuff. You know, we wanted to be again a button where you tap and you're talking, and that's it. Essentially, we wanted to build something that would recreate the experience of talking in person, in the sense that if I may say something wrong. But it's fine, you know. It's uh, it's it's human, and there's nothing wrong with that. As opposed to something where you spend a lot of time curating it and um, uh, and editing, you know, the best version of you per se. Um, and so, and then we show it to this guy. Um, this was uh, uh, this is Miles, our, our designer, and essentially we come to the conclusion that Roger was none of those things, right? <laughs> none of he was neither any of the, any of these things. And that's when we actually felt like, hey, we probably need to build. A team around this, right? And uh, in the meantime, and I'll go back a little bit to that. But of course, like the thing with fundraising, and I'll get I'll get a little bit. You know, I actually want to get questions from it about it. Is that it's in a lot of ways, it's a very sort of flirting kind of relationship where you kind of you know you you don't want to be the one asking the uh, you know asking for for funds. You you're kind of trying to get the other the other part to commit first. Um, and then eventually you have to move fast, and so and uh, we so we had been in in that kind of relationship with with several people, and then eventually we got to a point where we said we need the money today, uh, and this is very much the approach I I take in these things, and I advise others to do, which is the, to always like pitch your ideas and your and your decks as if it's a moving train that the either people want to jump on it or they will miss it and they will not catch it again, because people. Uh, 
especially investors can afford to, to wait. And, uh, and of course, that if, if you're an investor, you know, that's, that's the best thing you can do. You'll wait to, to see, right? Maybe it's a better investment uh, opportunity in, uh, uh, in six months than it is now. So investors will rarely ever tell you no. They will just kind of delay the, delay the answer. And what you can do to contradict is either, uh, you know, is essentially put pressure and create, if necessary, artificial deadlines. You know, you just make up a reason why it needs to be now. And in our, in our case, actually, it was, well, we needed to hire a team. And if we don't, you know, they're going to go away. And we were sort of lucky that we, had, we lined up a few candidates before we had the funds. And then we literally had to, to on, on this particular day, which I forget what it was, that I actually made this phone call saying we need the money right now in our bank account. Uh, because you should know this, even if you sign the term sheet, even if you sign, you know, the sort of due diligence process, everything, it's not over until the money is in the bank. And so we had done all those things, yet the money was not in the bank. And so, uh, so eventually I got on the phone and told Chamat, Chamat, if the money is not in the bank today by 5 p.m., uh, I will not be able to meet payroll, and we're going to lose our hires, and, you know, and you're going to essentially screw up your investment. And, uh, and uh, I think it was at, yeah, at, at 4.32 or something we had the money. So... So anyway, the, I'll, I'll get back to this and, I, and like again, I hope you guys ask about it, but again, either artificial or not, it's important to put this, these deadlines on both your team and the, and the sort of people you're working with. Um, so we moved on, right? So we hired the team and uh, we started growing and then eventually, you know, after a lot of late nights, you know, Roger went from what you saw there into this, um, which again, if you guys ask more, I'll, I'll focus on it, but I want this to be more... Um, uh, learning opportunity, but eventually, you know, got featured by New York Times and Time Magazine and a bunch of others. This also doesn't come for, for you know, for free. It takes a lot of hard work and, again, something I can also talk about. But, uh, of course, very rewarding, but in, this is probably the nicest part of it is actually when you start getting a bunch of people, like, emailing you and, uh, and telling you how, you know, wh what you're building is meaningful to them. Even the ones that don't like it and complain about it, you know, they're still putting time into doing that. And, and I, I never kind of take this for granted. Um, in the later stages, it can be sort of a, uh, uh, can also become a distraction. But again, it, it feels nice, again, when you go from zero to having something, you know, when these things start uh, happening. And then you start having people from all around the world, you know, even reaching out to you and talking to you in person, like uh, uh, Assad from Baghdad, who... I, I won't actually play the, play the video, but he essentially just was just like looking to make friends. And on you know, whereas we thought about Roger as a way to to talk with people you already know in your family, and then eventually a lot of people picked up on it and made it into their own uh, uh, sort of a social network where they want to talk to people around the world. That's another inter very interesting thing, sort of emergent behaviors that you didn't think about. But that's topic for another session, or maybe in the coaching sessions later in the day if you guys want to. Um, and then, you know, up into the right, right? That's kind of what you start focusing on. And this, in this specific chart, uh, it's, it's conversation hours. And this is how it evolved, uh, sort of, you know, from very flat into, into growing quite a lot. Uh, and th that's probably our most important metric, which is how, um, how, how many hours a day, like, do people speak? you know, in, in total, like, and uh, it was, of course, very awesome when, at the very early days, when you crossed uh, 24, right, when it was, there was essentially more hours of conversation per day than you could theoretically listen to, and, uh, and now, I don't, I think we're close to a thousand per day, I think, um, I think so, I don't know, and this is all essentially if you stack up all the little seconds and whatnot that, uh, that, that bulk up, um, and that's it, but like I said, that's topic for, for the, the sessions later in the day, because uh, we wanted more to focus on the zero to, to first funding and so on and so forth. Um, so that, that was a story, right? So, so now uh, I would like to use the rest of the time then to focus on, on how can we, uh, you know, how can this be helpful to you guys, right? And uh, what kind of um, what kind of questions you do you guys have about the fundraising process and and so forth? Oh wow, oh, there you go. Yeah. So how long did the fundraising process take, and uh, what was my uh, or our expectation, and what did it turned out? So. It, it can be long, uh, right? And it depends a lot on, it also depends a lot on, on, on you, uh, on yourself. Like, it, it always takes longer than people think, right? Even when, like I said, when you get a term sheet, the process, uh, the process you get a term sheet, uh, you might get, get several offers, but then eventually sign one. 
And now the tricky thing for, for entrepreneurs is that the term sheet is binding to you and not to the, not to the, to the investor. Um, which I always thought it was a bit messed up, but that's just the, sort of the rules of the game. Uh, what that means is that when you sign a term sheet, you cannot uh, continue shopping for other deals, right? So if I decide to sign this deal, the investor might still pull off, but you cannot, right? Or at least you cannot for about 30 days, I think, on average. So, so once you sign the term sheet, you're kind of you. The the intent is to to complete the deal. Now, most respectable VCs usually complete the deal when that happens and they do it as fast as possible because you know they're not playing with you they actually want to be your partner they want to work with you if you if you have a, a shadier one you know the it might actually happen that that they pull out and again you cannot for 30 days even if they pull out you cannot shop for another and they can go on to do other things right um but it, but yeah it takes i think from the point that you you sign the term sheet. If it's a reputable VC, it things tend to move fast. You will have uh, a lot of lawyers, like uh, you know, discussing. Be, you know, your lawyers discussing with the VC lawyers. Another interesting thing is that traditionally you pay the other lawyers as well, which also sounds a bit bizarre, but that's just that's just the way it is. It, even be even more bizarre because they actually get equity out of that money, right? Because you're paying the lawyers with the money they're about to give you, so their money converts into into equity. You just lost the money, right? So, so it's uh, so it's kind of interesting, right? But uh, hey, yeah, that's the rules of the game, I guess. And um, and anyway, lawyers bill by the hour, right? So lawyers love to love to stall things and to be be picky about about things. I see a few, <laughs> a few of my friends there are laughing, but it's just the reality, right? They they bill by the hour, so they'll make a big deal out of, of uh, every single thing. And there are a few things in the in the deal that are very important, and there's others who, who really aren't, you know, and the, and that they're nitpicking, you know, because it wasn't specified on a term sheet. Uh, one guy will say that in the in the valley they usually do this. The other guy saying in New York the deals they done before was like the other, and so eventually they can actually screw up the deal uh, if if you let them do. So that's your job as well as an entrepreneur and a CEO is to manage manage the, the lawyer so it's your choice lawyers are there to advise you so just make sure that in that process of like fighting back and forth you don't destroy the relationship because the minute you you actually get the money and you move forward you're partners right so so you know it doesn't make sense for you to have such a, a hard process where you know before you actually get the money and then you just destroy the whole relationship right so going back to the original question uh, sourcing, uh, sourcing the investors can take a lot of time. You have to take a lot of meetings. A lot of people say, you know, you have to take a hundred meetings, and then you get a, um, or you know, you get usually t better through introductions. Uh, you might get yes, you might get no, you might get no answer most often, um, and that in itself takes a lot of time. And then from the point on that you that you actually like sign, you want to move as fast as possible, uh, you know, and push your lawyers to every single day to 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 get closer. And even after it's all signed again. The money is not in the bank, and they will stall it as much as they can. But you know, but that's when you come up with arbitrary deadlines, and and you you push them. Yep. Just just a minute. I think someone's taking a microphone. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I want to ask about uh, where did you uh, found your first founder? Is it your network? Uh, this is the first question. The second question, what about that guy who emailed you about your hackathon uh, project? Mm -hmm. Is it also about your network? What do you think about uh, incubators, uh, crowdfunding? Should we, as, a, as a, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, look for uh, crowdfunding as a main source or go for our networks first, incubators? Yeah, I think, frankly, I think the short answer is that you should use what you have. Like uh, and uh, of course that in 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 our particular case it was through network right and and I would be lying if I said that uh, that parts of this parts of this were easier than than uh, most would have other things are are you know are equally as difficult you know that's just the reality um, but network is always be always better because the thing is uh, you know there's a lot of the, the the way the process works is that once you get, uh, I usually, it, it, I can talk a little bit about also how a VC firm is, is structured, but usually you have the partners at the head and then you have a bunch of analysts and the principals and whatnot. And, but the decision maker is the person at the top. So often you get an introduction to, to scouts and people you know, at, at the bottom, but their role is essentially to take, you know, 
a hundred deals, potential deals, or you know, and take them to the top. And out of those, you know, they're lucky if they make one. You know, because the guy at the top is the one that makes the decision. Now, often when the guy at the top says, "Hey, I want to invest in you," the 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 thing he does right after is he go ask the analyst, "Can you put together a deck that shows this is a good investment for us?" She's funny, right? Because it's like you already decided you want to invest. Now you just need to sort of rationalize it. But the reality is that no one knows. The investor doesn't know. And no one, no one really knows. You know, hey, this space is hot. You know, this team is experienced. Whatever. You know, that's all sort of. We're all just kind of guessing. You know, there's a few things that are good indicators that this might be a success. But at the end of the day, it's always like kind of a, a, a bit of a leap of faith, right? And and sort of trust. So if you can go through through network, that's that's better, right? Because theoretically, you're being introduced by someone who knows you, who knows like your ethics, he knows what happens when you get pushed and uh, when you get stressed. In our case, you know, he knows that Blix and I have been working together for now, I think, seven years, right? You know, we've been, we've been through a lot. And trust me that that's probably the thing that, that one of the things that is most underestimated about building a company is this relationship, is how strong this is. You know, when, when you go through, you know, through, uh, essentially when you go through shit and when you can't figure out, and then you know, and then maintaining this, right? That's the that's probably the one of the strongest things. So even the fact that you've, the so trust, right? The fact that so you've worked with them before, the team uh, the team has worked before, so that it's all about that relationship trust. So regarding your question also about crowdfunding, I pro honestly I probably wouldn't go for it personally. But again, if you have nothing else, then you should, right? I also, uh, I'm Portuguese, I also help some incubators, uh, you know, back in, in, in Portugal. And, and, you know, so I see a little bit of everything, right? You know, people that have strong networks and people that are just starting out and they don't. And if they don't, they have to, they have to of course, they have to go with what they have. But I also can tell you that a lot of people that don't have networks just simply make up their networks, right? When I came to the US, I knew absolutely no one there, you know? And then you just kind of hustle, like, a, um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I remember that yesterday we met uh, someone uh, from NUS in Singapore. You know, um, Ram is nodding because he knows who he's talking about. You know, was a student from Singapore, and I we've met her like two months ago in in uh, in San Francisco, and she was, you know, she essentially knew no one. You no, know, she was completely new. She was an, she was interning, you know, in in the valley with uh, Tilt, I think, and she. She went to, to a, she found her way to a, to a party by Golden Gate Ventures, and she went to every single person in the party, like every single, literally every single person, hearing their life story, you know, essentially like asking questions, just asking, asking, you know, about about them, about their background, and, and being impressed to a point that we're like, uh, at some point we're thinking, wait, why why are you asking these things? You know, this is getting kind of bizarre, but. She was so awesome in that sense, you know. She had, no, you know, she had no ego at all. She was just, go, you know, willing to learn, you know. And that's that's why everyone walked away, you know, saying, "Oh wow, she's she's amazing, right?" And and I think that if you would drop her in any context, you know, she would figure out her network, right? It takes time, but essentially, you know, you'd go after. So I think people like that are really, you know, probably have an easier time, you know, either because you're just too naive, you know, or young, and so you don't care and just ask, or because you know, or because I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Hi, hi, Ricardo. Yeah, uh, my question is, uh, by the way, my name is Aidil. Uh, mm -hmm. How did you guys survive prior to fu funding? How do you guys meet payroll? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, well, well, short answer is we didn't. Uh, we, we, we um, like I said, the first, for, for a long time, Roger was something we did on the side, right? So we had a day job. Um, by the way, be careful with that if you're building companies, because depending on what contract you have, you know you may not be able to build things on the side. We weren't uh, we weren't able either. It's just that when you when you actually decide to leave, you can talk to your HR department and ask them pretty please to uh, to you know to not sue you because you were working on something on the side. Um, but that's how we did it, right? We started building it before, right? And the thing is that when you go to, uh, to, to actually fundraise and to make this into your day-to-day -day job, you have to have something, you know? And a deck is something, but not, not too much, you know? But, you know, again, it's like a checklist, right? That's, that's the best way I can describe to people. Like, imagine that there's a checklist of, has the team worked uh, together before? Do they have experience from the area? Do they have a technical co-founder or, so tech, you know, some technical background? Do they have a prototype? Do they have whatever? And Essentially, what an investor is looking at is like, how many of these boxes can I tick, right? And so, so essentially, that's what you want to do, right? You want to you want to figure out a way, 
if if you really need the money before you can commit to it a hundred you know hundred percent how can I tick more of these boxes, right? So that when I do go go raise, I'm in a very good position, not only to get funding, but to even negotiate the terms that I'm getting the, the funding, right? And that's what that's what we did. In our case, and actually going back to the early question, it actually our fundraising took too long, exactly not because we wanted it sooner, because we actually we were the ones stalling it. Because we, we felt well, if we only get like another month, we can probably come back with a way stronger thing and get you know get more money at better conditions and so on and so forth. So yeah. I have a question uh, for Blix, actually. Mm -hmm. So you showed a slide about users reaching out to you, thanking you that this was built, and, 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 po and quite possibly with more feature suggestions. How do you, as and, and Blix, you're technical, and you're both technical, and you're more of a product person, you're more of a tech person. How do you balance the, the on one hand, you have various feature suggestions or product uh, suggestions from users. Uh, on the other hand, you have features that you want to build and design that you think are awesome. Uh, on another hand, you have features and designs that your competitors or other awesome apps have built. So you have basically these constant feeds of suggestions of product features or designs that, that, that you've been asked to incorporate into your product. How do you triage that? How do you decide which ones to go for? How do you make? How do you? How do you prioritize? Yeah, I think uh, it's important to collect feedback, but in the end, it's uh, it's a balance between intuition and data, basically. And early on, you you have to go way more for intuition than data because you won't have much data. Um, and and the truth is, you you gotta stay focused. So user feedback is important. You may discover something, but actually, 99% of the time, it's something you've thought about, and either you're already doing it or you're you decided not to do it. Uh, but I, I do think it's important to still have a user feedback channel because, like I said, 1% of the time you actually do find something very, very interesting. And um, what we did, we had a channel where people could actually talk to us directly via the Roger app itself. So, so you'd get a lot of people talking about how they were using the app with their, with their family or friends or colleagues. And we actually discovered a few interesting things there, like, like uh, a guy called Howard in, in Canada who, um, who uses it in the car all the time with his wife. And he... He uh, wanted Bluetooth support, so we, we saw what we could do about that. Sometimes it's actually just a few hours of work to make someone happy, and, and who knows where that's going to lead. Um, and also, he, uh, he's a teacher, so he would uh, want to be able to use Roger to talk to parents, and you discover really interesting things that way. But uh, again, I think it's, it's intuition and data, so, so if we can't rationalize, like, okay, Howard is the only person in the whole world who's going to use this, then we can't do it. Um, but if we think that, yeah, this could be useful to everyone, then, then go for it. Hello. I'm GP Chua from uh, Two Nice. We are into the, from farm to the, food, uh, to the food supply chain. Question to you is, is VC uh, from hell or is VC somebody from heaven? And can you share the challenges of handling them? Second question is, if you have to redo all this again, would you get money for VC? Thank you. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think, I mean, uh, in our case, I, I think we had positive experiences. Like I said, the, uh, the VC is going to be your partner, like whether you like it or not. I mean, often they will, uh, uh, you know, depending on what deal you get, they'll get board hits, they'll get board control, all these things. Um, again, in our case, we stalled the process to our advantage, so we, we, that's not the case for us. But regardless, but regardless, they're partners, and you should treasure that relationship because all VCs, uh, you know, talk to each other. That's a reality. Like if you take a meeting with with uh, someone, everyone else sort of in the same ecosystem will know about it, and uh, and you know, so that. Often uh, entrepreneurs also bluff and they, you know, they, they say, hey, the other guy offered me this deal and they all know in the background exactly what happened. And so as a consequence, if you have a bad relationship with your, with your investor, most likely others will know about it too. There's exceptions to this. There's, of course, like a few like horror stories of, um, uh, I have a few friends who've uh, both successful and unsuccessful that managed to, to sort of buy their investor out. Uh, and others that didn't, you know, because it, they were they were really terrible. Uh, others, it, it often happens. Actually, it happens more often than not with uh, with angels, because often angels aren't uh, aren't that experienced. 
um, not all not all the time. You know, there's of course a lot of experienced angels and the people who do it sort of professionally, but others that don't, and 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 then they will they will tend to get nervous and impatient and uh, and and can create a very hard time for you. So. Again, the best way for you to defend yourself for it is again the. Uh, this is where the personal introductions come into play, right? It works both ways, right? The answer I was giving to you, which is, the trust factor, right? You already know this. Someone, you know, you both, they both know that you're, sort of have strong ethics, but you also know that the VC has a as a good one. And I would also ask, if you don't know, I would always ask the the VC to introduce you to other founders in the portfolio, because the best thing you can do is talk to their CEO. And ask them, um, you know, ask them about the experience of working with that particular company. Uh, I've done that for uh, for other entrepreneurs for social capital. I, that's very very common. So, if again, if all VCs talk to each other, you know, entrepreneurs should do the same. Right? Makes sense. And uh, secondly, if I would take VC money again, uh, yes. I mean, there's multiple ways of building a company, um, and but. Uh, I like speed, right? And that's what uh, that's what uh, taking VC money the, does for your business. You know, it uh, it injects speed into into everything. So when you say inject speed, what do we really mean? And when I say angel, I'm not looking at angel investor. I'm talking about VC as an angel. Mm -hmm. But I'm more interested in the terrible things you have suffered under the VC, mm -hmm. so that all of us can learn not to touch the money or to grab their money. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, so when I say injecting speed, it means that you have money, you have resources, right? So if you, uh, it depends a bit on your business model, right? But um, if, um, you know, a friend of mine has a company that uh, makes very, very sort of high quality aprons, right? And uh, not tech at all. Uh, but, you know, it was a very much sort of grassroots thing. You know, she started selling them at, at small scale. She was working in, in jobs on the side. And it was a very sort of slow process. Eventually saw, uh, started catching on because she didn't have money to, to hire more people to put more resources into it, right? Uh, when you get VC money, it's, it, it's, it's a loan, right? You're getting a lot of money that you can invest up front and in a sense, you know, turbocharge your, your business. So it's not, the, it's not that the VC adds speed to you, it's just that the money allows you to do things uh, faster, like now, as opposed to waiting until you do have the money. Um, and pains that I had under, under, um, under VCs, like, to be honest, like, not so much in my case. Uh, we, we tend to be, uh, to over communicate uh, and and as a consequence, you know, um, if you keep it fairly t transparent, then uh, then I think, and again, if you did all that due diligence before of f picking the right person, you're less likely to have. But of course, there's moments, right? There's there's things that there's times that are that are that I wish that certain things had gone, you know, different ways, or to have more support in this particular way, or you know. But it, it's, I, I frankly think that if you did your ho homework well, and if there's any, and, and that is one thing I think we did very good, then you're less likely to have those. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Rizwan. I have uh, two questions. Basically, uh, one, uh, one, uh, the first question is uh, how you deal with the technology limitation. Maybe you have uh, your team have uh, something want to do. You come up with the ideas, brainstorming, but mm -hmm. uh, you have to realize it, right? So mm -hmm. maybe in your team, you cannot with the technology that you wanted. So how you deal with that? Then mm -hmm. uh, another question is that uh, how you make uh, people initially to use your system? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Right. So regarding technology, of course, you're always under time constraint. You wanna, you wanna like prove something as fast as possible. So I, I think it's always go with a hypothesis that you wanna prove uh, and build the very smallest prototype that can prove it. If, and by prototype, I also mean like hack something together in your existing app. Um, so that's how you avoid technology limitations. Like uh, a lot of people make the mistake of go having an idea that's great and then building it completely. You know, like um, it's, it scales, it looks pretty, all those things. But in reality, it might still, it's, the world is random. It might still turn out that that was a bad idea and then you waste it all the time. So you, that's like how you deal with technological limitations that you, you prototype, you, you hack it together. You're like uh, there's clouds, uh, cloud systems today. You can, you can put something in the cloud really quickly. It's, it scales to a certain li limit. You, you, if, if, you can't, if you can't release it to lots of people, then do user testing, uh, which is basically 
There's usertesting.com. You upload a prototype. So you have someone record their session. They're trying it out. Or go to a local Starbucks, pay someone like a gift card for, for coffee, and they'll try out your app for you, and you see what works, what doesn't work. Um, but never try to make the perfect solution first before you test it out. And, and regarding how do you get people to, to use your app, I mean, there's, of course, like multiple, multiple ways. In our case, a lot of the growth came from, uh, from uh, PR. You know, I glanced over it, right? And I said that it takes a, to, that it's not for free. Actually, you don't pay for it either. I mean, you can, of course, get a PR agency to help you, but it, it just takes a lot of time and, uh, and, you know, and education and, and, again, relationship management, right? You know, uh, uh, getting to know journalists, uh, reading what they what they're writing about, and then and then you know kind of pitching to them in the angle that makes the most sense to them, and you know and of course that when you get uh, you know published by the New York Times um, or um, actually got in print as well, uh, which is a bit old school but awesome still, um, and um, eventually you know people discover the app and then and then. Again, depends on there. There's a lot, of course there's a lot of books on this and and a lot of blogs and whatnot and there's so many things you can do, right? There's uh, right now we're doing uh, some stuff with influencer marketing. There's uh, you know Mo Spotify did a lot of paid acquisition, which in their case makes sense because they have a, uh, a sort of monetization plan figured out, and then so essentially it becomes a mathematical issue uh, or problem, like how you know how much you can afford to pay for for that user and you still making money. Um, depends on it really depends on the business, right? Uh, in our case, the kind of app that, that it is, it's um, it depends a lot on the existing clusters, right? And and sort of group behaviors and uh, in um, one to end behaviors, you know, things that you know you uh, coming on on board impact like multiple people, right? And then if you do like and if you do that well, which is harder than it seems, then things start growing. Now, true virality is actually people think about viral growth as the, as the idea of like that you know each person will get two other people on, you know, and there's this. Uh, has anyone heard about the K factor? Yeah, so the the thing with the K factor is that it's uh, it's very few very few companies, if if any, like actually are able to sustain a, a K factor uh, of you know over 0.7 for a very long time. And K factor, for those who don't know, is, is means that for every person that that you get on the platform, how many come you know as a consequence, right? So the way to think about it is that if each person that comes on board invites 10, uh, and then out of those 10, uh, you know let's say uh, five sign up, you get the idea then, uh, and if they activate and so on and so forth, you know, you make the calculations and you get to, the, to a number. And at times you may actually have over one, which theoretically is exponential growth, right? Because each person you get, you'll get this, the more than one person, so it, it's exponential. But, um, but it's rare, it's very rare and it's not, usually not sustainable. So then what you have to do is do a combination of things. Build your product for viral growth, but also do, you know, do PR, do paid acquisition, do a bunch of things all together. And, and all those things stacked up together actually do lead to, to growth. Does that make sense? Yeah, but uh, each company has its own formula. So again, something great if you guys want to talk about it later in the day. More questions? Hi, uh, my name is Jiang. I like have small questions uh, related to the. Um, just I was thinking, what is your backup plan with you feel, for example, any uh, let's say in terms of financial, in terms of other, other you know, launch uh, and a new uh, startup. Thank you. Yeah, I think frankly, I think that it's. Um, you can't. The thing is that you cannot walk into something, you know, thinking about the plan B. You know, uh, the reality is that if you if you spend uh, and you cannot uh, equally you cannot predict all the problems that you're going to have, and that's uh, that I can tell you is a mistake that I've done uh, you know way too often. And the the problem that happens with that is that eventually you stop committing to things because you have too many open doors. And if you have too many open doors, you have too many orphan features. You have too much things things open, and you're not very strong at, at them, uh, at any of them. Um, and a good friend of mine once once actually told me that you know uh, that hey Ricardo is good that you have a back actually it's not good it's, it's terrible that you have a backup plan to to everything because you know you cannot do that and that's actually even if I can cope with that myself that's terrible for your team because uh, you know the, you need to walk into things uh, thinking that they will succeed 
and um, and if they don't, you move on. And the way you move on is be, is because instead of grieving about the thing that just failed, you're so focused on the next thing, that that you that's a sort of perpetual thing. And if you keep that that mentality, and if you have enough time, eventually things will things will work. If you so uh, so regarding so that's that's kind of that's kind of the point, right? You know, Plan B is is a waste of time, you know? You figure out plan B when you get to plan B, you know? When you have to. And um, of course, some people will have more of a safety net than, uh, than others, but that's, a, that I think, the biggest learning that, or one of the biggest learnings I had as well in this process was that, was that to focus on, on, the, on plan A, you know, and then, you know, and you figure out plan B when, if, if it ever comes to that. More questions? Hi, uh, my name is Aizidin. Uh, I have one question. Uh, you start your app in USA, right? How mm -hmm. you go globally? How you reach your first user in Baghdad? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so that's actually the thing we're doing with influencer marketing, which is, which is, um, so the PR that we got was very focused on the US, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But there's a, Funny enough, we did get a collateral of like you know certain pockets. You know, you saw that uh, that user was in Iraq, for instance. So there's a few pockets of people that every now and then pick up on things. We had uh, you know big spikes in in Turkey, for instance. We actually have uh, interesting uh, group of users in Malaysia as well, and we didn't really go after them. They just kind of came as a collateral, right? And and that was just because the product was built that way. Um, but then specifically when you, but like I said, that in itself will not, will not work by itself. So the answer I gave before about the conjunction of things, when you actually wanted to make it work, is uh, you, know, you find partners or people to work with in that particular market. So in certain markets we're, we're talking to, to carriers, um, uh, but we're, and we're also doing stuff with local influencers, like for instance in Brazil, working with, uh, with YouTube celebrities, you know, they have large followings in that specific language. And uh, you know, and working with them to promote to promote Roger. But yeah, but it's all his local people essentially, and he helps going there essentially. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Ying Wei. I'm from Smart Peep. Uh, thanks a lot for sharing your interesting story. Mm -hmm. um, I have two questions. Uh, first one is, uh, can you give us uh, your best advices, like do's and don'ts, when we go for pitching, talking to investors? Mm -hmm. Okay. Second question is, have you ever turned down any pitching opportunity, and why? Thank you. Uh, so, what was the second question? Um, have you ever uh, turned turn down any pitching opportunities? Like, you have an opportunity talking to an investor, raise funds, but you turn down that opportunity. You, you don't want to go. Uh, can you tell us why, if you have done that before? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's fun. Um, it's actually a fun, a fun question. So, best advice. So, again, uh, I used to say a lot that... Uh, that that uh, raising money is a lot like uh, it's a lot like dating, um, so you wanna you wanna keep things uh, somewhat interesting, not not uh, not show your full deck of cards. So funny enough, when I when I um, is this being recorded? I don't know what I should say or not, <laughs> but um, here's the thing: when I met uh, when I met Shamat for the first time, um, I spent the first the first 20 minutes asking him questions about their portfolio, what they do, and what not. To the point that it was kind of frustrating because, you know, he was like, when are you going to tell me what you're working on, right? <laughs> and I was like, you know, you're going to have to ask, right? So, so that's the thing, right? It's always, it's always kind of a power relationship and you always want, uh, you know, you always want the people to, to ask you first, right? And so in this case, you know, I just, you know, I just walked in there with a smile and just kept asking questions about them. People, you know, pe this applies to sort of everyone around the world. People love talking about whatever they do. They're talking about themselves, or they're talking about their children, or their wife, or husband, or whatever. So you just keep asking questions, right? You just keep asking them and keep asking. And then uh, you know, there's there's a really good book on this, the the Dale Carnegie, the How to Make Friends and Influence People, where it says that the best conversationalists, you know, are the ones that just essentially listen, because uh, you know. It's like, whoa, wow, this guy talks really well. Well, in reality, no, you were just making you talk, and that's why you feel good about that that thing. And so, that's the same. The same thing applies to to sort of VCs, right? So, uh, for 20 minutes, uh, I just ask questions about them, uh, and that's kind of what I would advise as well. And then finally, when they ask, you know, then you're in a sort of in a in a power position, 
and then you start talking about it. And in reality, like I said, we had built a prototype already. Already, so uh, here's the sort of my uh, dirty little secret, which is I do have a pitch deck which I could show, but I never actually showed it to to any investor. And in reality, to to Chamat and Social Capital, I only sent it to him after he had already committed to invest, and it was more to sell to the other partners. You know that hey, I'm, I want to invest in this thing. And uh, the reason was because we had a prototype, right? And we and we spent a lot of time talking and, and talking about, you know, I ask, ask a lot of questions about Facebook, how this thing happened, how that thing happened, and then eventually I figured, th that's the other thing. The more you listen, the more you know, how do I tell my story in a way that this particular person that's listening finds it interesting. If you're, if you're spending too much time talking yourself, you have no, you know, you have no clue. So through listening to him, you know, then I, when it was time to show him, it was like, I'm glad you asked the question because look at this. This is exactly what you were talking about, and then it's just like boom, mind blown, right? So, and um, so that's so that's uh, what I would advise. You know, spend uh, as much time as possible trying to listen to it. It's great to have interrupted meetings uh, in the sense that um, I do I do this all the time. You know, for instance, when I'm in investor conferences and stuff like that, I like to talk to people but I never pitch what, I, what I'm doing. You know, it's always like kind of a, uh, getting to know, yeah, okay, here's your card, like, yeah, we should, de we should definitely talk, blah, blah, blah. And then you, you kind of left it interrupted. Oh yeah, I gotta go there. Because again, it feels like leave stuff unfinished and, uh, and then you can follow up in a different context, you know, but you drop the seed, right? And that's kind of what, uh, what I would, uh, would advise, you know, so don't show your, in, immediately your deck of cards. Play smart, you know, be, be interesting. That's one, but. There's probably others. I, th I think we might be out of time, right? But uh, like I said, there is, we're going to be in the coaching session later today. And, um, and I realize it's a very large group, so it's hard to do actually breakout sessions because uh, I actually was curious to know what you guys are working on. So please come to, come to that, show us what you're doing, and hopefully we can help you uh, do something. And we're also looking forward to learning with you. So thank you.